this new segment that we're doing on a weekly basis, hopefully if all things work out, called Last Week in Design, where we're going to talk about the things that are being tweeted, things that are being buzzed and hashtag and shared on social media, and we're going to dive right in, okay? You guys want to be part of this conversation, feel free to comment on our YouTube. Both Mark and Ricky and Eric are here joining me, and they'll be monitoring your questions and comments as we go along here. What's up, you guys? Good to see you. Okay, so we have three stories for you guys this week. First up is uh, people have been asking me about, Chris, what's your opinion on this whole Nike thing and Colin Kaepernick and the Nike ad? And it, it's gone pretty crazy on the internet. There's been very strong responses to this. So let me get into it in case you don't know, because some people don't know, they're not reading news or maybe you're not from America, but this is what's happening. So Colin Ka Kaepernick is a, was a former NFL quarterback and he was the first person in the NFL uh, to protest racial inequality and police brutality by taking a knee during the national anthem before games. And this has stirred up some emotions, some very strong emotions, because when it gets into the anthem and the flag, people get really kind of mm, on angst there. So look, look at this sign, what it says here is, have you thanked a vet lately for your right to, to disrespect our flag? So it's touching some nerves, guys. So here's the strange thing. So Nike releases an ad just last week, and they feature Colin Kaepernick pretty prominently, and they, they release this line. It says, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And then what happens immediately? People start responding on social media, on Twitter and elsewhere, cutting off the Nike logo off their socks. They're, they even gone as far as Oof. burning their shoes, which is a little extreme. Very bold. Excessive. Yeah, it is excessive, right? And even our president has gotten involved in this by tweeting certain things about this, which I'm not going to share right now. And then all of a sudden, the New York Post estimated that Nike lost $3.3 billion in market value after the announcement. That's a lot of money Lots right there. Money. That's a lot of chatter, guys. Yeah. So the, my question is, why would Nike take this risk? This seems crazy. And if you look at Nike's total athletic footwear in terms of the U.S., the brand share, it eclipses everybody else. It destroys everybody else. So why would they do this? So I have some thoughts on this. One is they're starting to slow down. They struggle to grow. And they're facing competition from Under Armour and Adidas or Adidas. Is that and how you say it? They, what's that? Is that how you say it? That is how you say it. Yeah, the Europeans pronounce it Adidas. Anyways, uh, they've also been trying to do more in the casual lifestyle, which Adidas or Adidas or Adidas, I'll just say it the American butchered way, Adidas is destroying. They're totally destroying. They own that market, okay? And so you're thinking to yourself, why would such a global brand like Nike risk their fortunes? And it seemed like initially after the announcement, people on the radio were responding to it as their market shares were collapsing or imploding. And so they were wondering how long would Mikey, Nike stick to this concept? How long would they stand by Colin Kaepernick if everybody was going to abandon it? But lo and behold, just wait a little bit. So here, the hill, Nike stocks fully recover after Kaepernick ad. So here's what has happened here. Nike shares were trading at $82.96 on Tuesday morning, higher than where it started before they started launching this ad on September 3rd. That's pretty incredible. So I want to talk about this a little bit, you guys. Why would they do this? Well, here's the thing. If you want to capture a younger, more urban demographic, you have to do something that connects with them. And I think a lot of people relate to Colin Kaepernick and his protesting of br police brutality, especially towards people of color. So it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Now, they run the risk of alienating some of their customers, but they're looking to, to grow new customers and to be relevant in that conversation again. I want to throw this out to you guys. We're going to do this show for 30 minutes. We have three topics. So first topic, Aaron, Ricky, Erica, do you guys have any thoughts on this or any comments coming in yet? Well, uh, Aaron's not here, but we got some. Oh, comments. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mark and Ricky. I Mark is the spirit here, and the loving memory of Aaron. Yeah, Aaron's next door. He's editing. But, yeah, um, the theoretically. No, people are just saying hi from the countries that they're in. Uh, nobody's really asking any questions yet. Um, I personally like the ad from Nike. I think it's a bold statement, and I'm not necessarily thinking that they're trying to do it to take a political stance. I just think they're trying to play to their demographic. Yeah. How could you say they're not taking a political stance? Well, I, I think that it's motivated. I, I just don't think it's a politically motivated stance. Like, I don't think they're backing certain. I just think it's a money decision for them. And they stand to make more money because standing with that side of the argument makes 
them seem more profitable because clearly their stocks have gone up and that's their demographic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think very bold also. Um, that's what I'm seeing from them. But as far as it being such a polarizing decision to support someone like Kaepernick, I think they went the right way. And if we look historically, you look at a lot of the different athletes that they've sponsored, mostly controversial. You look back with uh, like John, John McEnroe, he mm -hmm. was one of the uh, rebels of tennis. Uh, Michael Jordan, he had uh, some issues where he was wearing like, a certain color shoe during a game when they were only asked to uh, you know, wear white sneakers. But this issue at hand is much greater than that. And when you have the, uh, the president weighing in on his opinion, I think that, uh, that really sends a signal. They've always wanted to back up athletes, and I think supporting Kaepernick in this situation is a strong move. There okay, let's talk about this a little bit more to kind of add a little bit more context to this conversation. I don't know if you know this, but I don't know if it's related or not, but since Ka Kaepernick started protesting the anthem, he's not played football in two years. Like, no, no team would sign him, and he's kind of toxic right now, so he's lost his ability to make a, a living doing what it is that he's good at and what he loves. Here's some other things that you want to be aware of. So the NFL, their, their ratings have dropped, but that's nothing to be alarmed uh, um, by because generally TV ratings have fallen consistently with the NFL ratings. And so they can't also run the risk of having some very polarizing political statement that's affecting their core audience, right? So nobody wants to touch him as a team owner, and now he doesn't play. So here's the thing is Kaepernick is also now suing the NFL which Nike also sponsors. So this is kind of like making Oof. a strange thing where now they're going to give Kaepernick his own shoe, which a lot of people are running to the stores to buy to support him and, and believe in what he believes in. So he has a way to make a living while suing the NFL, while Nike is also doing a very lucrative Nike or NFL sponsorship deal. So what do you guys think uh, in terms of the, the fallout from all of this? Well, I think they're thinking a long play. Um, you know, they're looking at their core audience and they're thinking, okay, who are the people that support this type of cause, whether it's political or not, whether it's red or blue. Um, I think in the long run, you know, they're attracting a younger generation, which really wants to stand for something and uh, stand, stand for something within the athletes that they sponsor. Similarly, um, you know, they've had an issue with some news that came up with LeBron James. They're saying, hey, like there was a news reporter that said, you know, shut up and dribble. But he took right. that and doubled down and said, yeah, I'm going to make a documentary out of this and show what athletes are about. And I think that Nike's uh, customers are willing to support those type of things. Mm -hmm. And for better, or for worse, our society, our culture, our community have put athletes who are physical specimens up on a pedestal and they've become role models and sometimes spokespeople. Michael Jordan was uh, famously, infamously known for not making any kind of statements politically, right? Like he was a businessman and he knew that he wanted to keep some of the politics out of sports, right? Right. Yeah. And he, I think he said um, Republicans also buy shoes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people uh, in the community were criticizing him for not taking a stance, for not using his influence and his reach to draw attention to issues that were important to the community. So here's the thing. It seems now, because we're in hindsight, we're looking back, that things seem to be okay. We're not quite sure yet the long-term play and how this is going to work out, if this strategy has, had worked out or not. But I know when that announcement and the ads were going out and their stock had dropped precipitously, that people were thinking, oh my God, did they just yeah. make a $3.3 .3 billion <laughs> mistake? I think there's a lot of... Uh panic selling but if you look at the stock today they're at an all-time high it's like 83 dollars so it right yeah and so they, the rise and fall like what if it stayed there for a week mm -hmm. a month six months a year yeah what point do you cut bait yeah right and that's what they were talking about on the radio and it's it's interesting that it's fully recovered since then but what happens then like how how far do you stick to your guns and stay committed to a campaign and supporting an athlete or the ideas and values you champion and mark you said this to me too in the writing the the ad that campaign they too were willing to risk everything mm -hmm. yeah it's ironic they support the their own uh, slogan there and they're risking their business mm -hmm. for a campaign like this mm -hmm. given it's just, i think they're even making a greater push because this is the 30 year anniversary of the Just Do It uh, campaign. So they're launching all kinds of stuff this year from this to um, athletes as uh, young individuals. Um, 
they have a female push, so the force is female. So, uh, you know, they're really trying to hit it at all ends on this 30 year uh, anniversary. Mm -hmm. I, I think you said ironic, but it's actually not ironic. It's consistent, right? Consistent. Cause, yeah, yeah. they're very consistent that they're not just writing an ad campaign. It's part of their ethos, their mantra. OK, very good. Um, Anything else we want to talk about the Nike thing? I want to put this issue to bed. Well, I, I love it. I think it's an amazing, bold move. And I think it is an amazing time when you can be an athlete and be shut out for your political views and, and not be able to make a living. And mm -hmm. a company like Nike steps in so that he's able to provide for himself and his family. I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And since he had not played fo football for that long, it's interesting that he can get an endorsement deal and people can, can, can buy his sneaker to support him. And that's essentially what they're doing, right? Right. And I, I just, I'm reminded of something that Simon Sinek said in his talk, Start With Wire, The Golden Circle, which is people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. We exactly. trust people who believe what we believe. So if you're for equality, if you're also even for your, your right to free speech, which even people who are veterans and very patriotic say, like, I went to war so he can have his opinion and he can say what he wants, even though I may not agree with it. Yeah. I mean, Colin Kaepernick got the idea to kneel from a former veteran. So just kind of in there's always a supporter um, backing what you're doing because of a free speech. And just another point is I love the Nike ad with Charles Barkley. He's like, I'm not a role model. I'm right. a basketball player. So that's another mm -hmm. great point with Nike. Now, how old were you? Were you six? Oh, I definitely, <laughs> definitely wasn't born. Definitely. <laughs> you weren't born at that time? Were definitely. you that young? Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. That's how old I am because I remember that <laughs> campaign in real time. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at the other things that Nike has supported. Like they, they made a uh, hijab. To support, oh, yeah. um, right? Uh, the fencing, fencing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, for I fencing the the athlete. Yeah. yeah. So you know they're really going out on limb to support minorities, and I think that's uh, a big opportunity for them, both from a marketing standpoint and a political standpoint. Um, but I think from a marketing standpoint, this is this campaign specifically is pretty genius. I mean, it's very simple, just a black and white photo of Colin Kaepernick. And you know that thing was going to get memefied. So I think that day of, there's already these meme generators. You just plug in your text and an image, and then I'm sure you guys have seen the gamut of those. Right. Both good and bad. Both yeah. good and bad, right? So this is what Mark's talking about here. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Very powerful, right? Okay, let's move on to our next story. And we're going to go now to Uber. 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 Okay, so Uber... This is their second major brand overall in three years. So you're thinking, oh, my God, what is going on? This is bananas. There's lack of leadership, direction, focus. Hmm. Okay, so let's take a look back. The original Uber logo was this U, and a lot of people liked it. Now, I have some problems with it, and you can tell right now by just by looking at it, it already feels dated, and it's not even that old. The forms, the way that they're drawn. So when they launched with a new rebrand, it was like the circuit board thing, and then People are like crying, like, what happened to the U? So we didn't love the U, but we liked the circuit board even less because it doesn't seem to stand for anything. So to kind of put this in a little bit of context, Uber was having a lot of problems in 2017, and they lost about $20 billion in terms of their value. So amidst a lot of controversy, then-CEO and co-founder Travis Kalanick resigned in June under pressure from investors. So they brought on... Dara Khosrowshahi. And so uh, usually when you bring in, did I mess that up? Shahi. 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 Khosrowshahi. Yeah, there you Sorry. go. Sorry. There you go. Thanks. So whenever you bring in a new person, and now we're seeing ads from him talking about safety is important, listening to customers and riders and doing what's right for everybody, I kind of expected a brand refresh to happen, and surely it did. Here's the other couple things that you need to know. One is now that Uber is in 70 plus countries, so there's some language and culture issues that they have to work through. What was really important to them was legibility, and some observations that was the circuit board was really confusing and controversial, and people were clamoring to bring the U back. And the, the directive or the brief was focus more on a word mark, less on the symbol, and hence the new Uber logo is drawn. It's rounder, it's highly legible, it's upper and lowercase versus all caps. And as you guys know from a legibility point of view, as you're driving down the freeway, your eyes will recognize the shape before you can actually read the words. Also one of the problems why I have a problem on the freeway merging onto the north or south ramp, because it's the exact same shape. 
it would be much better if they just put the letter N or the letter S because they look very different and you can read that. So they enlisted the help of Wolf Olins, who have done some major projects including Spotify, Hyatt, Gap Red, on and on USA Today, and they came up with a pretty beautiful system. Now this one I'm going to talk a lot about aesthetics because I don't know about all the business issues, but usually I'm the first person to tell you guys do not focus on the aesthetics, don't just focus purely on the form. But the form is so beautiful on this one, I gotta talk about it. <laughs> like beautiful typography posters, well designed. This, I, I, I wanna applaud this in case there are other tech CEO, CMOs watching the show that general designers and the public do appreciate good design. And they thought through this as a system and there's many components to it. I'm just gonna highlight a few things here. So this arrow, the arrow has become this thing for movement and an icon that can be used from going from one place to the other. The arrow is very reminiscent to me in terms of signs that you would see at the airport or a transit or subway, any kind of movement system. The arrow indicates that and I like that and that's just a secondary element. And look at how they thought through this too. The U, the Uber shape, the U, is optically designed and they're using this as a grid system to run little ads as well. So I thought that was pretty interesting how they were able to tie that in and think that through. And I remember reading some things in Fast Company about how they were designing the logo and the typeface simultaneously. So they've come up with a new typeface called Uber Move and it's very rounded. It looks very legible, modern and clean. Beautiful sans serif typeface that they can use for lots of different things and that is exclusive to them. Now I would love for one day for somebody to hire us in a, in a brand or rebrand to be able to afford the ability to design a custom typeface because I know just the right people to call to be able to design a beautiful typeface. So it's pretty cool when you have a typeface that you can call and name after yourself, right? <laughs> that Mostly. is pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Probably so pretty cool. I, I think the reaction on the internet so far has been, what are they doing? What's going on? This is kind of craziness, but oh, by the way, we love it. So there isn't that kind of design backlash like, oh, that's just so terrible, terrible aesthetics. Turning it back to you guys, what do you guys think? Thoughts? I mean, I like it. It's it's simple. I mean, I can easily distinguish it from the apps on my phone, which is what I'm going to use it for. Just like, where's Uber? There it is. That's what I need it for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I personally like it. And I think uh, the last one was a little confusing. Um, I think the all caps, it kind of yells at you. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm not a designer um, by practice, but the round uh, typeface does look a little bit more friendly. So I think that's what they were trying to go for, trying to soften um, their brand image. And this comes after an era with Travis uh, Kalanick, who you know, had a lot of um, political yeah, sort of things issues. going against yeah, a little issues. In, so there are some, some issues water. there with, yeah. with females yes. uh, within the workplace. So What was the talk in, in Silicon Valley, Mark? Uh, what was the issue? I don't know exactly the talk, but uh, yeah, it was, I think... Um, People were unhappy. Yeah, there was yeah. information that he was dis, uh, sharing within the company on how to treat sexual harassment. I don't right. think uh, everybody was happy with that. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but... I think uh, with this new theme of mobility and international um, uh, reach, uh, I think they're do doing just that with all of their new video assets and the commercials too. Mm -hmm. And looking at the new mark, I, I want to look at this. And so let's talk about this for, for a minute here, guys, because everybody's going to look at this and say, um, yeah, that's, that's a font. It yeah, looks like they're yeah, in Silicon basically Valley. basically what I said. Is that what you said, Ricky? No, I just, like, I don't have an opinion either way. Like, it's... It's cool. Like it's, I think it's uh, similar to the first one. It's better than their little, little pin thing that they had. Everybody's saying it was a um, derogatory thing. Their middle, the one that they had in the middle. Okay, yeah, let me yeah. find it. Let me find it. Oh, give me a second. Where is it? <laughs> yeah. Here? Yeah. The, the the one on the right. So the circuit that, board. Yeah, I didn't like the one on the right. People had a, a really uh, negative name for that. I won't say on live. Uh, find but. the politically <laughs> correct version of saying that. Yeah. Um, where you export waste. Oh, your butthole? Yeah. Your anus? <laughs> your rectum? Yeah. Your sphincter? Yeah. You, there's more words that you can Looks use like here. Yeah, I'm trying to be super... Come on, man. Hey, my, mom, okay. my mom might be watching. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, mom. Be careful. I'll say it for you, okay? You can say those words. Any words that a doctor can say, you can say. Come yeah, on. Yeah, so people, actually people in the chat, you know, like, oh, the butthole logo. So yeah, <laughs> I, I was I reading about it. it. You like, need to change friends. <laughs> it's on the chat. It's not. Shut the front well, door. Shut well, the front door. Okay. You can what look. Do you, what do you think of that okay. from, uh, you know, like from a functionality standpoint? I mean, you look at a car coming at you, and I think if people didn't recognize that was Uber to begin with, um, it's it's a big circle with uh, the circuit, the uh, plug behind it, or the the circuitry. Is that recognizable? And you know, what are they? Is this new logo going to um, solve that issue? 
Yeah. Okay, let's let's look at the logo. I'm going to take out my Professor Design Ninja hat here, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, okay? If you look at the first logo, there's all kinds of things that I would encourage people not to do. But the first thing that there's a gradient built in, and I think this is a monostroke typeface where the stroke weight is consistent all the way around, so it's not been designed to be optically balanced. You'll notice always in the corner of the U, the lower parts of that U, it feels thicker because that's what happens there, right? So when we talk about optical balance, the vertical strokes need to be a little bit thinner than the horizontal strokes. Or I, I, did I mess that up? I'm sorry, the horizontal strokes need to be a little thinner than the vertical strokes, okay? And if you squint your eye and that thing's coming at you, depending on what country you're coming from, you may or may not be able to see that because it's contained in a box and the circuit board, AKA the butthole, that's just a circle with a square in it, right? Oh, and I suppose you can tell what that is. But if you look at this thing here and it's the squint test, when you look at this thing here, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can recognize the shape almost immediately. And I, I do want to tell you guys, the, especially some of the younger designers who are like, oh, I shouldn't have a car in or have speed lines and add all this kind of decorative element. When you're really designing to solve a problem, like in the beginning of this segment, I talked about it, like they, they want to bring the U back and they did. They didn't want to get rid of that. They want to make sure it's, it plays friendly in international waters, if you will, that it's recognizable, that it also communicates a certain kind of friendliness, and it's very, very legible. And that's really all you're trying to solve. And so that's a unique letter combination that Uber can own as a word mark. I applaud it. To resist the temptation to decorate and adorn it with things, because what you get is you get things like this. You get decoration. You get people adding things that don't need to be there. And I believe for as long as they exist moving forward, this logo can serve them really well. It's broad, it's open, it's highly adaptable. They have a beautiful typeface that they paired with it and we're good on that. Right. So let's involve our community and our audience. Is there anything they wanna to add to this before we move to our third and final segment? Um, people were asking how much water you drink. Um, really, <laughs> I, nobody's, nobody's really asking any questions. They're just saying whether or not they agree with somebody's point of view so far, uh, what we've stated. But yeah, nobody has any questions. Right. Um, that pertain to the topic. Well, I have something to add from a business standpoint. I think what Uber is really trying to do here with this rebranding is also, in addition to you know the crisis response and uh, trying to improve some other uh, legibility and other business issues, um, they're coming out with a lot of new um, offerings to uh, product offerings. So, I mean, just this morning, Ricky and I saw some new bicycles out here in Santa Monica with their jump bikes. Um, and they're going to try to get into scooters as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is in addition to what they're doing with... This is a competitive space, man. Yeah, it's very competitive. you got the bird scooters, you got yep. the uh, lime scooters. So uh, it's just going to get really colorful out in these streets with all these uh, modes of transportation. Okay, so before we move on to our last and final segment, I do want to talk to you guys about something. There is something called the last mile, which is what big transportation companies are trying to solve. So if we improve the public transportation infrastructure, if somebody drops us off an Uber, but it's not quite convenient or whatever, we need to get to another um, a bus station or something. The last mile is what everybody's trying to work on right now. So you see a lot of collapsible bicycles, electric scooters, things that you can get to where you need to be without congesting the street, um, the roads with more cars and more pollution. So the electric scooter market is very, very hot. It brings it with it a whole bunch of problems like storage, pickup locations, because they're being thrown in the streets everywhere. And so there was backlash in San Francisco, so they banned them temporarily, I think, because people were doing all kinds of things. And you can't help some dissidents to kind of grab it and just throw it into the street, which becomes a problem too. Yep. Okay, very well. So we're going to move on to our last story here. And this one is uh, an observation and a question, and I'd love to get your opinion on this. This was about the Emmys. This happened last week, and there were a couple of titles that were up for consideration to win the main title design. And the person who won it, or the team, was led by Karen Fong from Imaginary Forces for their work for the main title counterpart. And some really beautiful work here. That looks awesome. Image from the ceremony, and it's all the glitz and glam. Uh, I've been a participant in Emmys before and have won one myself. And there are two Emmys, the one where all the beautiful, famous people show up, and then the ones where we show up. <laughs> Wait, tell me a little. So they're broken yeah. out into different... Uh, different days. Kind of, kind of, okay. Yeah. So we got the large You don't mingle with the rich and famous, you know. Event. 
Yeah. So you're so, not sitting next to like Leo or something like that. Like what's that? You're not sitting next to like a famous movie star, like Cheers and Glasses and all that. No, stuff? no. The Emmys is for TV, right? Broadcast. So you won't sit next to Leo DiCaprio or Johnny Depp unless they're doing a TV series. But you, uh, if you go to the main one, uh, the primetime Emmys, as they're called, uh, the, the the famous and rich people will be there. So I mean, you you could sit somewhere in there. You're not going to sit right close up to the front of the stage there, but you you have your moment and you get to pretend like what you do matters and people care. But really, only snippets of this get cut and edited and released. So you, you you're not even sure if anybody will ever see it. I recognize a couple of the names. They went to Ringling with me. Oh, nice. which ones? Jake Ferguson and nice. Hyun Nam. Nice. All right. Beautiful. I'm so proud of them. That's awesome. Yeah, and so it's a very glamorous thing. You get to walk the red carpet and nobody knows you or cares, you know, and then you get to <laughs> win your acceptance speech and all that stuff. And or you give an acceptance speech and here's uh, Miss Karen Fong being congratulated by her team and other um, members of the t- title design peer group which I used to be a part of. Mm-hmm. And I want to spend I want to tell you guys a little funny story about the Emmys. Okay. Way way back when, I think 5 6 7 years ago before I started doing this stuff on YouTube. It, it, it was just, I was full of anxiety because I, I won a peer-reviewed Emmy, and it's different than a, than a juried one where, uh, where the, I'm sorry, where people vote on it. So the, 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 the one, the peer-reviewed one, they vote and you, you win. You already kind of know ahead of time that you've won one. And I was told that I need to prepare a speech, and it was supposed to be under 30 seconds, and to write it, to memorize it, and be ready because they don't want you to be bab- babbling on. And they said, if you say something funny, interesting, and memorable, you might make the cut. So I'm stressed out. I want it, but I didn't want to accept my award because I knew I was going to have to go on stage and be in front of people. And that scared me, scared the living daylights out of me. And I asked my coach, Keir McLaren, at that time, because you're allowed to bring a plus one. I said, who should I bring? I was thinking about asking my executive producer at that time to come with me. And he looked at me like this, like, are you kidding me? You bring your wife. How often yeah. are you going to win one? Take her out on a night, a night on the town. This is your excuse to like glitz and glam it up and look good. I mean, she's got that dress that she probably wants to wear, so you should do this. And luckily, I had that wise man saying that to save my marriage. <laughs> Smart guy. Because we were photographed together, and it felt really good. Awesome. But so here I am. I'm sitting in a place where I'm not supposed to sit um, because of some last-minute mix-up, right? And... I was thinking at any moment now they're gonna call me to go backstage, but I'm wondering like what's happening because it's the category, right? And then my wife like um, elbows me and she's like, "Hey, I think they're looking for you." I'm like, "Who?" I turn out into the aisle and there's a page like kind of crouch walking and saying, "Christo, Christo, Christo." I'm like, "Oh, that's me!" <laughs> and the reason why I couldn't hear it because I was so nervous and trying to say my speech over and over again in my mind. And my knees were shaking. That's how bad it was. Jeez. I mean, acid reflux, everything that you could imagine <laughs> that someone would go through as an introvert, I was going through. So I sprang out of my chair. I'm like, hey, that's me. And he's like, oh, my God, come come with me right now. <laughs> and so they grabbed me, and they were going to take me out the back way, like how you're supposed to go out. But he's like, we have no time. You understand the showrunner has been looking for you. Oh, man. So we cut up the aisle way. Let me bring it back to that slide here. Okay. We cut up the middle of the highway while they're doing other presentations. We cut across the famous, uh, there's a couple of famous good looking people up front. And I look at them like, oh shoot. And I'm wearing my brand new suit from Dolce & Gabbana, brand new shoes from D&G. And they're slippery. If you guys ever wear dress shoes? Yeah. yeah. They're brand new. They're slippery. And oh, yeah. I'm walking. I almost ate it on the way up because oh. we were walking so fast, right? At least you look good. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> good I might make the uh, outtakes, you know, of that show. Uh, Asian dude trips and fall. And, right? So I'm I'm like just, just running across there and I get up. Now my heart rate's going. Not like it needed that help to begin with. The adrenaline dump is about to happen. So I'm, I'm backstage behind the curtain and they walk you through the entire process. They have one Emmy. They give it to you, so when you accept it and you go back off stage, you have to give it to the other person. I think there were two. And so we're all swapping and sharing the same Emmy until you pick up your real one with your name on it. Nice. So I'm in a line of people who are about to receive the award. I'm like, oh, dear God, please let me just say this the right way. And I'm rewriting the talk or my 30 seconds of fame in my mind. And the guy behind me, he's really upset. He's like, can you believe it? The show's running long. They're not going to let us speak. 
<laughs> oh, hallelujah, there is a God. Oh, my God, I don't have to say anything. That's what I was thinking. I don't have to say anything. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to talk to the show producer. They're going to let us speak. You're like, don't. He's like, dude, dude, relax. So I'm like, okay. So he walks away. I was like, oh, no. So I'm going through a range of emotions. I have to say something. I don't have to say anything. I have to say something. This is just too much for me to take. He comes back. He looks at me. Sunken, dejected a little bit. They're not going to let us speak. <laughs> <laughs> We're back in, baby. We're back in. We're so good again. So finally, I'm inching towards the end of the edge of the curtain where you kind of step onto the stage. I step out. I hold the statue. My suit is so tight. I am the thinnest I've ever been in my life. I hold that thing up. I'm ready to collapse. And I look at the picture. I'm like, you fairy. Hold that up like a man, will you? Hold it up like a person. I'm not going to show you guys that picture. Okay. Uh, Why not? We can look it up. I, I, I don't have online? it right now. I, who knows where it is? So that again, that award was for a music video. It was for okay. a music video for uh, art direction and design. Got it. Nice. That was for the Ravenettes video that we made. Cool. Nice. Yeah, and I want to thank uh, the the team who submitted that for me because I didn't want to submit the work. I didn't think we were going to get one. So it just wow. goes to show you, you got to try if you want to if you want to have a shot of achieving something, okay? Now, the whole point of talking about all this Emmy stuff is to say congratulations, Karen Fong, who's a friend of ours, a friend of the show. Good job. Woo! Congrats. Woo! Yeah. On your Emmy. Excellent. Yeah, people ask me, they remember forces. her from the show. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You guys here. can check out the show. We'll put that link somewhere around here. Somewhere. My team may or may not do that. Anyways, so the question I started thinking about was in 2018, here we are in September or marching into October. In 2018, do awards still matter? What do they do for you? Do they help you get a better job? Do, do the doors open up? Like the Hollywood studios are going to start calling you. Netflix is start, start calling you. Like what does it do for you from a personal and business point of view? What does it do for your own artistic validation? Because people seem really happy about winning one. I've won one. It hasn't changed me at all. I'm still as big headed as I was before. <laughs> right? It hasn't changed anything. If anything, it's a shorthand, and I do reference it, that I'm an Emmy Award winning director. Because for some people, that means something. But for me personally, we've won so many awards. It, it's just Maybe it's me just becoming numb to it, but I just I don't know what it means anymore. I still respect, love, appreciate Karen Fong and the work that she's done over the years. Super smart work. And this doesn't change one bit for me. No, I think you hit hit the nail on the head there. I think pe how people perceive you, how people interact with you, by you saying you're an Emmy award-winning director in art direction gives you some credence, gives you some weight. So when you speak, people will listen more because if you're just Chris Doe and people don't know the context behind hey, it. Be careful how you say just Chris Doe. <laughs> Be very careful with the next word you choose there. Well, you're an Emmy. I'm the Chris Doe, exactly. not just Chris Doe, the right? Only, the only one I know. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it just gives some more weight. So when, when people talk about you or you're speaking, they know that it's coming from a place. All right, check this out. Ricky, you're, right. you're a new film grad, right? Yeah. Okay, and what if we just said, Ricky's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. Right. Look at Ricky right now. What's look up, look right into his eyes, <laughs> Ricky. Going? I wish we had a zoom control, like zoom in on him, boom, Please right? Don't. What does that do for you? Nothing to me personally, but how people interact. I know. With so let's ask our audience right mm. now. You guys are watching this on the live stream. Yeah. What do you think of Ricky if we just added Emmy Award winning director? Yeah, does, does that, that change his, your perception value? of Ricky? If I'm about to do something with film. I think you have to put it in that context. Like, if you if I walk down the street and I wear a sign that says Emmy Award winning director. <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, is my other shirt. Yeah, which I never wear. Like, that's that's in my other shirt. I didn't, I didn't pull yeah. it out today. But if if you're asking me, like, how should I direct this scene? And then I go, oh, I'm an Emmy Award winning director. You might go, oh, okay. Yeah, Maybe but, you know, check this out, though. I've never introduced myself in person. <laughs> saying that, uh, excuse me, no, I'm the yeah. Emmy Award winning I'm director. I'm a little douchey. <laughs> right? Uh, actually, where's my... I mean, I should just walk and travel around with it, like in that promo, right? Just hold it and walk around. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I would like, too. Like, why? But... No, I wouldn't. Yeah, I've no never one... done that. No, but people that know you, people that come to you for work, come to you for advice, that is your, like, a byline. It is something you attach yourself to. It's something you're proud of. I think that's where it gives some weight to your name and where it helps you. Mm, yeah. So this is what I really want to talk about because I'm not sure that it does. I think the people that don't have one think of it like that it will do that for them. But right now, let's cut back to Ricky. Oh, Ricky is a guy wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. 
red baseball cap backwards. Yes. Uh, forever, you know, what is that? That's not a five o'clock shout out, that's beyond. You're, yeah, you're yeah, like yeah, tightly yeah. trim facial hair. Yeah, there you go. And whether or not you say Emmy and you walk around with it, we're, we, I think in theory would still judge you based on the work you've done, what you say, and the actions that you take. I agree. Right. So the rest of it is just an asterisk, right? Just like I think the opposite is true. Let's say Ricky was an ex-con. I hope that's not the case, but let's just say Ricky was <laughs> clean, record. clean news clean, right now. Clean this record. just in, Ricky ex-con. <laughs> no, you know that good. you're beyond the things that you've done in the past, and that's just a sliver of you as a person in a timeline. I don't know. I'm just throw that out there because a lot of people make a big deal out of winning these awards and having these professional accolades. I know they, they fill out the resume, but you guys know how I feel about resumes as well. I want to judge you on your work, what you have to say, your ideas, your thinking. That's what I care about. Right. Well, I think from a business standpoint, I mean, there maybe is a little bit to gain. Maybe they gain more clients because they see the recognition and the validation from people in the industry that see that as right. you know, a highly coveted prize. Right, right. Um, and it could also be used to, um, to attract talent. So, hey, I want to work for a studio that's reached that level of, uh, you know, of notoriety. Right. So there's, there's some business purpose so here's there, the but thing. I think, yeah, maybe All it's right. not that important. With the exception of two awards that you can win, two, the Academy Award, the Oscar, and to a similar degree, the Emmy, which is something that the general public knows something about. But if I tell you I won a BDA Award, a Pixie Award, London International Film Festival Award, I've been featured on this magazine, basically they're just industry publications and awards to sell awards, essentially. You have to submit a piece of work that you pay for the submission. And when you win the award, they give you one. And if you want to order more, you have to pay for that. So who cares? Mm -hmm. If you can't say the award and your mom or your dad or the, your neighbor down the street who knows nothing about the industry that you work in, how does that matter? So is it more of us doing it for ourselves? Are our, our egos and self-worth so fragile that we need some other person to tell us that we're worthwhile? worth listening to, worth right. respecting, right? Right. I think it could be seen both ways. Um, and I think it really depends on what you're going into a project um, as a goal. So is the goal to win this prize? Maybe that might change the direction in which you run the project because you're just trying to win that award. But if you're trying to solve a business problem with this project and you're trying to um, you know, sell, you know, increase business and increase sales, then you know, maybe that's what we should base it on if it's important or not. So what I want to say is this, if you've won a prestigious or even not a prestigious award, share your experience with how your life has changed or not changed. Please comment in the section below. Tell me your story. Tell me if you were able to up your day rate, if, you were, if the phone was ringing off the hook because you won that award. It has not been the case for me and maybe my experience is unique and rare and everybody else is tripping over buckets of cash. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, it did help you in one situation in Europe that I could recall. What's that? We got into a restaurant that was packed <laughs> in Madrid. <laughs> Thanks to okay. the boss lady. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Right, I'm going to make a note of that. Wait a restaurant. minute. Restaurant. Okay, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to talk about this. This was before I was here. I need to know this. Yeah, yeah. This is a good story. <laughs> you're you're saying awards don't matter. Okay, yeah, so tell us the story. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're in Madrid, and after I do my workshop, uh, the our host, hostess, she's like, let's go eat. So we all go, and... And it's way more people than we can fit in a restaurant. It's crazy. I think there were 15, 16 of us. And it, it, that little intimate group of three or four people just grew into this bigger thing. Right. So we're trying to find this restaurant. And, of course, they want to bring the out-of-towners to the most popular restaurant there is where we're at. Right? So we walked in, of course. There's a line out the door. How are we going to get in? But I, I, I love the tenacity of this woman. I'm, I'm forgetting her name right now because Mark just sprung, sprang this on me. We walk in the door and she says, we need to get in. And she's talking to the guy and she's like, no, it's not going anywhere. It's not looking good. And then she's like, let me talk to the manager. So she keeps working up the chain. She's a professional. Yeah. I want to travel with this woman everywhere I go. So she's going through this and I can see the talk and then she points to me. And I'm like, you know, the whole bit. And I can kind of tell body language wise what's going on. And you can see the, 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 the manager's body position change first. It's like, and then it's kind of like, it softens a little bit. I'm like, huh? So she comes back. She goes, we can't get in right away, but he at least will get us in tonight. Normally, they would say, go away. It's not happening. And she said, I had to drop some 
some some words. You're like, that's an Emmy Award winning director. He's not in town often. I want to show him the best place in town. And I told him this was the best place. So that's, it did get us on a wait list cool. of 30 yeah, minutes. Yeah, tables so yeah. she dropped that on that. Now, I want to challenge Mark here. He said that it got us in the restaurant. It did not get us in the restaurant. 100%. That woman got yeah. us in the restaurant, and that's totally different. That's true. She could have told him anything about me, but she had the moxie and the confidence to present it. I wasn't walking around with my Emmy t-shirt. I wasn't carrying the statuette. So he, how, he's going to go IMDb or just look it up. Like, how would he even know? Well, I think, this it, is about I think it added to belief. I think it added to her argument, though. It did. Yeah. But she could have totally made it up. That's true. True. Now, it's not the first time I've been admitted into a restaurant where I shouldn't have been in <laughs> because of the Emmy thing. But that's another story. I've never used it myself. But it's given me a marketing idea, you guys. Here it is. It's going to be, I'm with him, the Emmy <laughs> Award winning director. And I'll make 10 of them. And so that'll just point to me, you guys. Yeah, I just, How do you guys need, feel about I that? I need one. I need one. We need one? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna so you can hashtag, I'm with the Emmy Award winning director. <laughs> Yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> and just an arrow, okay? <laughs> All right. I have one more story to tell you guys. So I think in the entertainment industry, the highest, the highest, the pinnacle, the top is the Oscars, the Academy Awards, right? Yeah. Do you know what happened to Cuba Gooding Jr. when he won the Academy Award? Uh, he freaked out. He, he, he did freak out. He won an Academy Award, I think, was it for Boys in Hood? Yeah, I don't remember. Either that. Yeah, I think so. I think he won it for Boys in the Hood. Yeah. Well, or something like that, right? Not for uh, a few uh, good men. Well, we can look it up. Okay. A few good men. Let's see. Let's see. This is an easy internet search. And while we're doing that, I want to say hello to the 467 people that are watching right now. How you doing? It should be a really quick search. Cuba uh, Gooding Jr. Best actor in a supporting role, Jerry Maguire. Oh, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Yeah. Show yeah. 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 Show me the money. Show me the money. Show me the money. Show me the money. All right. So he wins that, and then, and he admits this, his career took a dump. Hmm. He disappeared for years. It's why you're not seeing Cuba Gooding Jr. everywhere right now. So what happened there? He wins the award, he admits his head got, it blew up. He started getting really picky with roles. He started becoming more difficult to work with. So here's an example where winning the highest award is totally a brain, a brain screw, a mind F on him. And he admits he, he let it get the best of him. So you see, I think, like many things that I talk to you guys about, your self-worth, your self-confidence, the love that you have, it needs to be here, not there. Because those influences can go away. The people who support you can go away. The people who love you can go away. Right. That's why you need to love yourself, you need to respect yourself, you need to see the worth there. And I think, I think, we're almost done. This yeah. is a little bit more oh, than a half an over hour. 30. Nice. Okay. So I want to say a few closing remarks before we get out of here, you guys. We're doing new 30-minute segments um, almost every week on a daily basis. So we're starting to roll some things out. If you guys didn't get a chance, you definitely need to check out Freelance Fridays with Matthew. It's probably maybe over somewhere. We'll there. link it. We'll it's link there. it. Yeah, Sorry. We'll it. Go check it out. And Matthew will be back with doing more of those. And we have a couple other segments. Tune in this coming Wednesday for Logo Therapy. Another 30 minute segment, we're gonna take two logos and have two people joining me and we're gonna do some magic together, right? All right, guys, this is an episode of Raw, 30 minutes. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you very much. Let's get us out of here with the track. <laughs>